Activation of the pressure pad releases a locking mechanism, launching a violent, spiky offensive onto the victim's leg, shattering the bone. Hello and welcome to The History Project. My name is George and this is Pete. In this episode, we've made a pilgrimage to the city of Canterbury. We're going to be exploring one of the city's most iconic landmarks, the largest surviving medieval city gate in the whole of England. Come with us. Coming up on this episode, I'll be discovering when and why this incredible structure was built, taking in the amazing views of the city from up on the roof, whilst I will be delving into its rather dark use, as well as getting to grips with a 19th century man trap before meeting back up with George in an old Victorian police cell. We'll see you soon, Pete. The construction of the west gate we have today began in 1380. It was part of the strengthening of the city walls to counter the threat of invasion from the French during the Hundred Year Wars. It was built using Kentish ragstone and was partly funded by the Chancellor of England, Simon Sudbury. Unfortunately, Simon Sudbury wasn't alive to see this incredible structure completed. He was partly responsible for the punitive poll tax, which wasn't popular. A year after work began on the largest of the city's medieval gateways, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Chancellor of England, Simon Sudbury, was murdered at the Tower of London during the Peasants' Revolt as punishment for his tax. Work continued though on this amazing structure and it was complete by the middle of the 1380s. Nobody knows for sure who designed this rather ambitious structure, but it was probably the King's master mason, Henry Yeevil. Defence aside, the Westgate also acted as a status symbol for Canterbury. It was covered virtually entirely with coarse ashlar of Kentish ragstone, which would have come at quite a price. You have to remember though that the West Gate faces the road to London and would have admitted the vast majority of visiting pilgrims to the city, offering a powerful first impression. Access to the city through the gate was originally over a drawbridge above the River Stour, a natural defence in itself. Historically, the West Gate is important as it represents one of the very first defensive structures built with the use of gunpowder and artillery in mind. It uses keyhole gun ports for the use of cannons from a well-defended position. And by the very beginning of the 15th century, cannons were in use here at the West Gate. The gateway has two drum towers and is spread over three floors. Both towers feature a ground floor room with fireplace and four gun loops. The first floor contains a large room with a fireplace and originally the portcullis mechanism over the vaulted entranceway. It was where I left Pete earlier. This large room has doors to the upper room of each tower, which featured three gun loops and a fireplace for the soldiers to keep warm. A further staircase leads up here to the roof, which is 60 feet above ground level and offers great views of the city. When it came to defending the city from attack, the Westgate's 18 gun loops made it a force to be reckoned with. But defending the city wasn't the Westgate's only use over the years, and Pete is going to tell you more. Eventually, in 1453, the King of England, Henry VI, granted Canterbury permission to use the Westgate as its city jail, 
and many prisoners were kept here in cramped and terrible conditions. So it's no surprise that escape attempts occurred, and some of them were imaginative and daring. In July 1842, an army deserter named Benjamin Jameson escaped by tying a rope round the frame of his cell door and lowering himself from the tower. But my favourite escape occurred in 1866, when a thief named George Nell escaped by jumping from the top of the tower, surviving only because he landed on a passing hay cart. The Westgate also imprisoned debtors, people whose only fault was that they couldn't settle their bills. Now I find this unusual, because whilst they were locked up, they were unable to earn an income to pay off the debt. As these unfortunate people hadn't committed a criminal offence, they were kept separately away from the criminals at street level. This is where they were able to plead for help and support from the local populace by dangling a shoe through a loophole by its laces. Some expressions were believed to have originated from this practice. For example, living off a shoestring, which was believed to have originated because debtors in British prisons were lowering a shoe by its laces from a window to collect funds from visitors and passers-by. Back then, as I'm sure you can imagine, prisoners were not treated as humanely as they are nowadays. And here at the Westgate are some amazing exhibits that illustrate just that. First of all is the branding iron. During the 17th and 18th centuries, crimes could be punished by branding. Branding irons like this one were heated until they were red hot and then used to burn a mark into the victim's flesh, scarring them forever. This sometimes happened in the courtroom as soon as the sentence was passed. This particular branding iron burnt an M into the victim's flesh. An M stands for malefactor, which means a person who commits a crime. Now this brutal practice last happened in Canterbury in 1765. Next is a man trap. If you thought a branding iron was bad, it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Believe it or not, this is a 19th century man trap designed to capture thieves and trespassers. Now this reminds me of a bear trap. And like a bear trap, it's got a pressure pad. If you stand on that, you'll know about it. Of course, you'll feel it way before you see it. Activation of the pressure pad releases a locking mechanism, launching a violent spiky offensive onto the victim's leg, shattering the bone. Thankfully, the use of man traps were made illegal in 1827. Now up next is the gallows. These four posts were part of the old gallows. Now when it comes to punishment, the worst thing of all is to be put to death. And in Canterbury, hangings did occur from time to time. Some people would even bring their kids to watch as a stark reminder of what might happen if they didn't behave. The first person to face the noose here at Westgate is a lady called Margaret Hughes, who murdered her husband in 1799. As Canterbury grew in both size and population, the Westgate Towers became inadequate as its city jail. So in the 1820s, they built a new jail next door at number one pound lane. And a high level bridge was built to connect these two buildings. Then in 1865, the Victorian Prison Act led to the closure of the city jail. And the Westgate was commandeered by the city council and used for the storage of archives. Thankfully, this didn't last forever. And it reopened its doors to visitors in 1878 becoming a museum in 1906. So, what happened to number one pound lane? Well, come with me and we'll find out. After 1865, number one pound lane ceased to exist as the city jail, but it did still manage to accommodate criminals because it became the city police station and it remained as such till 1965. Nowadays it's a fantastic bar known as The Pound and it has something really unique to offer, an escape room set in a genuine Victorian police cell. And if that ain't enough... The bar has made good use of the remaining police cells and you can come in with your friends, have a drink and wonder if walls could talk just what stories they'd tell. Thanks folks, we hope you've enjoyed the show. Finally, we'd like to say 
A big thank you to Canterbury City Council and all of the amazing staff here at The Pound and of course the Westgate Towers. Don't forget to follow our page on Facebook. See you again next time. Yeah. Cheers, Cheers brother. Mate. Nice. Thanks for watching guys and thanks again to our sponsors. If you would like to sponsor us, reach hundreds of thousands of people every single month and help support our project at the same time, contact us for details.